Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about symbiosis. We've talked about how creatures interact in the world a little, but sometimes the relationship is a little more complex than just predator and prey. So what is symbiosis? Well, it's a relationship of some sort between two organisms. So the two organisms live together either temporarily or over a long period, sometimes even the whole life of one of the creatures. And at least one of the organisms must benefit from the relationship in some way. So there are three main types of symbiosis that we will look at. And what are those types of symbiosis? Well, they are called mutualism, commensalism and parasitism. And you might be able to guess the meanings from looking at the words. With mutualism, both organisms benefit from the relationship. It is a mutual relationship. With commensalism, one organism benefits from the relationship and the other doesn't really care. It's unaffected. And then finally, with parasitism, one organism benefits, but the other organism is actually harmed by the relationship. They will suffer in some way. So we'll take a look at some examples of symbiosis and the first one is particularly grim, a tongue-eating fish louse. So the parasite finds its way into the fish's mouth and it eats and replaces the fish's tongue. The fish continues to live uh, but it has no tongue and the louse can then continue to feed from what the fish is eating on because the fish is using the louse as a tongue. So this is parasitism where one organism is harmed by the relationship although it does continue living. Another very famous case of symbiosis is the relationship between bees and other creatures like this hummingbird moth and flowers and plants. So they feed on the nectar in the flowers and as they do so they pick up pollen that will fertilize other flowers for flower reproduction. And this is a case of mutualism where both species benefit from the relationship. So we need to spend a little more on this relationship, specifically a little more time on bees. So one of the most quietly scary aspects of global climate change is colony collapse disorder. And what this is, is bees dying in great numbers. So sometimes whole hives will die out. And one of the main effectors of this is neonicotinoids, which are a new kind of insecticide and they are used on crops but they do kill bees at an alarming rate. So honeybees pollinate a large percentage of our food crops and there are no real alternative species to do it. If honeybees die out or become unsustainably small in their population, humanity will have trouble growing enough food. So this is a very very serious issue that no one has really yet put a serious spotlight on. Now to be fair it isn't just humans who are bringing about the death of bees. There is at least one other species that is heavily responsible and that species, the destroyer of bees, is here. An electron microscope took this image of Varero destructor, the name of this beetle. And this parasite lives on honeybees and it drinks their bodily juices and it feeds on their young in the hive cells. The bees are weakened and they also receive very serious viruses that can lead to genetic defects. So young can be born unable to fly. So this is a very clear case of parasitism and it's leading in part to colony collapse disorder. So a slightly less depressing example of symbiosis is the relationship between cattle egrets and cattle, a large creatures on the African plain like wildebeest or buffalo. So the cattle, as they feed on grass, 
they stir up insects and they disturb other small creatures like mice and snakes. And the egrets hang around and they look for a creature trying to run away as it's disturbed by cattle and they will eat those. So this is a case of commensalism because the cattle don't really benefit from this relationship but the egrets certainly do. Some species of birds live on cattle and eat the parasites, the ticks and lice that live on them and that would be a mutual relationship but this one is not. So clownfish and their relationship with anemones is well documented and the clownfish are not stung by the anemones but other fish are but some fish are able to feed on the anemones those are called butterfly fish and the clownfish will defend the anemone from other predators and in return it can live in the anemone and not be affected so the anemone keeps it safe. So this is a mutual relationship where both species benefit from the relationship. So rhyosia and legumes. What are those things? Well, this is the root mass of a legume plant. These are plants like beans and pulses. And inside those little root nodules, the small lumps, you will find bacteria called rhyosia. And the rhyosia are very important in fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. So the bacteria take nitrogen from the air and they create it in a form that can be used by the plant. In return, the bacteria lives in the root nodules that the plant grows for it. So this is a mutual relationship. Head lice. So humans have had head lice for as long as we can remember and the lice live on our heads, in our hair, and suck on human blood. So the effect of this on our health is actually very little, but hey, they are sucking your blood. So is this a case of parasitism, mutualism, or commensalism? Well, in some ways it's parasitism because you, know, you have blood for a reason, so keep as much of it as you can. Anything that takes your blood is harming you, right? But it doesn't really have any significant effect on you day to day, so you could say that this is commensalism. There is no real effect on humans. However, there have been some new suggestions that actually this could be a mutual relationship. Some people have suggested that Possibly the effect of the lice feeding on humans is an immune boosting response so that the human host will be less susceptible to other louse based viruses and infections. So this is an interesting new hypothesis. Well, sometimes symbiosis can get out of hand. Some parasites don't just harm their hosts, they can literally control their hosts' minds. And this usually happens in insects, and I think this is because the insect mind is simpler and perhaps easier to control with simple chemical signals. But, well, here is one zombie worm, the hair worm, which infects crickets and it lives inside the cricket and eats much of the body while the host is still alive and when it needs to reproduce it has to reproduce in water so when it's ready it controls the cricket so that it jumps into a body of water where the worm can leave the now dead drowned cricket and reproduce in water. An even more perhaps extreme example is the cordyceps fungus. So this is a zombie fungus, sometimes called, and it makes ants climb up a tree and fix themselves on a leaf. And then when the ant has done this, it will grow out of the back of the ant's head, now killing the ant. And then the spores of the fungus can rain down and infect other ants. And the ants have recognized this danger. There are stories that some ants will recognize an infected ant and carry him away or carry it away from the 
colony so that when it climbs a tree and the spores rain down, they will rain down harmlessly. So to summarize, symbiosis is a situation where one or more organisms are involved in a relationship from which at least one of them benefits. The three types of symbiosis are mutualism, which is when both organisms benefit. Commensalism, when one organism benefits and the other doesn't care and is not affected. And parasitism, where one organism will benefit and the other is harmed or as we have seen sometimes even killed by the relationship. So that's symbiosis. It's an interesting and sometimes very strange area of biology. And that's all from me for now. Bye bye.